Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for Shared Leadership, How Better Team Dynamics Can Improve Organizational Effectiveness. We're very excited to have you here today. Uh, my name is Lucy Sullivan, and I'll be your host for today. And before we begin, I'm just going to cover a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, we are recording today's webinar, so you will get a link to the recording and the slides, um, and we'll also follow up with a blog post that has a lot of the key points um, and some Q&A uh, with our experts. That'll all come to you via email, so don't worry about that. Um, due to the size of our group today, everyone um, is, of course, in listen-only mode and your cameras are off, but we absolutely want to hear from you throughout the broadcast. So uh, probably all of you are familiar with Zoom at this point, but you just navigate to that Q&A icon right at the bottom. Um, you can put in questions at any time during the webinar. You don't need to hold them for a certain point. Um, those will come straight to me and we will get to as many as we can during the broadcast. Um, and we'll also then uh, follow up on any that we didn't get to. Um, we will follow up on those after the session. Um, so please just put those in at any time and comments, of course, additional resources um, on this topic are always welcome as well. Uh, I will give you now just a brief introduction of who MRG is uh, and who's going to be guiding you through our content today. Uh, MRG is a global leader in designing assessments that impact people in profound and meaningful ways. And we have solutions for leadership, motivation, personal development, sales, service. Uh, they're insightful, they are research backed, um, and they're designed uh, with action inspiring feedback to, so, and to help people uh, foster a deep sense of self awareness so they can pursue growth. Uh, MRG was founded more than 35 years ago, approaching 40 now, um, and our assessments have been used by thousands of certified practitioners in more than 100 countries around the world. They're available in, in many languages. Uh, and we have two presenters today. Uh, you'll have Trisha Nadef and Drew Rand. And Trisha is the president of MRG, and she's been working with individuals, teams, organizations for more than 30 years in consulting and coaching, product design, research. Uh, you may have seen her speak elsewhere. She also shares MRG uh, research around the world. Um, she's presented here in Maine, but you may have also seen her um, at events like ATD, Society for Consulting Psychology. She's been a TEDx speaker, a uh, contributor to Association coaching magazine um, and Drew is based here in our Portland office as well and uh, he's been with MRG as an IO psychologist for uh, just a couple of years and made a very big impact in that time. Uh, he also has a breadth of experience in consulting and developing leadership programs as a coach and um, working with developing our products uh, and Drew has an endless curiosity for assessments and, and uh, plays a very important role in designing um, and creating those as well. Uh, so, without further ado, I will hand things over to our experts. Thank you, Lucy. Welcome, everybody. Um, as many of you may know, uh, Drew and Lucy and I are all uh, speaking to you from the U.S. Um, and so you may know that we are in the midst of um, making a choice as a country about who will be our leader for the next four years. Um, we know many of you are with us here in the States and are probably feeling the need to refresh your news feed on a regular basis. Um, so as Lucy said, no worries, we are recording this. Um, an interesting time, I think, for all of us to be talking about the idea of, uh, of shared leadership. So thank you for, for joining us. We, um, we appreciate your, um, your sharing your time with us on this particular morning. So our agenda today, um, we're going to talk about how expectations for leadership have changed so dramatically over the last many decades. Um, we're going to talk uh, to you a little bit about some of our research and how our research has led us to the point of uh, a strong belief in the notion of shared leadership. We're going to talk to you about how neuroscience has informed our thinking about shared leadership. And um, we're going to take you through a case study around uh, just a recent case study about how shared leadership helped a particular senior leadership team. And then we'll um, end with just sharing a few tips, uh, practical tips that you can just take away with you um, and use beginning as soon as this webinar is over about how you can help leaders within your organization or your client organizations move to some notions of shared leadership. So let's get going. Um, let's start with the, the exploring how the notion of leadership, what we expect of leadership has changed dramatically throughout the years. So I'm not gonna take us all the way back to the beginning of time, but let's go back to the 60s and early 70s and look at what was expected in the, in the leadership space. So 
early on management, um, we weren't really even talking about leadership, right? We were talking mostly about management. And um, usually you had a pretty homogeneous group of people. And oftentimes the manager was promoted from within the work group. And the expectations were pretty simple. You were supposed to be able to communicate expectations well, like tell these direct reports what you expect of them. You were supposed to let them know how they did relative to these very clear expectations. Um, and you had a little bit of individual contributor responsibilities, but not a lot. Most of what you were doing was managing often sort of these six to 10 direct reports. As time went on, as we moved into the middle of the 70s, there started to be a more robust um, development culture. And so we went from not just communication and feedback, but there was like, this idea that you were supposed to help these direct reports become more effective, build the, the managerial pipeline. This is the beginning in the 70s where we started to hear this phrase, do more with less. So you had to cap your head count. You weren't gonna get any more money in your budget, but your goals were increasing. So the idea was do more with less. Um, change was starting to become a more regular um, idea in the workplace. And so as a leader, you were expected to manage change, both the mechanics of change and the human reaction to change. Um, as a result of that, both do more with less and manage change. Now we started to see innovation come into the leadership landscape. You were supposed to be an innovative leader thinking of different ways to do more with less. During this time, the expectation for what work groups were going to produce increased. And so the goals started ratcheting up, right? So do more with less became higher and higher in terms of goal expectations. This is also the time, although it's taken a while for this to actually take hold, but it was, there was some sensitivity training. And basically what it meant, particularly when it started was, um, we weren't going to tolerate um, screaming um, at direct reports as frequently as we allowed it before. As we moved into the 80s um, and into the 90s, things became more complex. Technology started influencing more the way we were doing work. Um, businesses got more complex. More people were entering into the marketplace, making the competitive landscape more complex. And so leaders were expected to be effective at handling complexity. We were flattening out organizations during this time, right? Diminishing the hierarchy. So we moved more individual contributor responsibilities over to the leadership roles. So now people were about half-time individual contributors and half-time leaders. Enter in the concept of executive presence, right? How this really came into being when we were starting to talk really boldly about what's the difference between management and leadership and this idea of this amorphous idea, by the way, still in 2020, there isn't agreement on what this means, but this idea of executive presence to really show yourself as a leader. Coaching as we moved into the 90s became um, more and more a, a means of developing people and as uh, organizations understood how helpful it was, but also how expensive it was, we now expected leaders to begin to uh, become effective coaches. Diversity and inclusion became a much um, uh, more important element of thinking about organizations and therefore thinking about leadership as we went into the late 90s. As we went into uh, the 2000s, um, we grabbed this VUCA idea from the military, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. This was the shift from managing change as an event to it's always going to happen, so you need to be effective as a leader. And so that brought on the idea of agile leadership. You never know what's going to happen. You have to be quick on your feet. You have to be able to turn on a dime. Um, and then we talked more about global leadership, right? Competitors are global, our customers are global, our vendors are global. Um, it's a global mindset. And so we need leaders, by the way, we never really defined this very well, but we need leaders who have a global mindset. Employee engagement has now become ubiquitous. 
every leader is now expected to build employee engagement. So when employee engagement came on the scene, it was more um, an HR kind of expectation that HR would measure and HR would put programs in. But as it became more commonly used and individual leaders got their scores, there was the expectation that individual leaders would become effective at building employee engagement. Um, mindfulness came on the scene around 2010. Um, there were uh, a, a number of organizations in Silicon Valley who were making great claims about how mindfulness was helping productivity and helping teamwork. And so it's made its way into the organizational space of leaders need to be mindful and leaders need to, in some cases, teach or encourage mindfulness in others. Um, of course, setbacks are happening. Um, we are winning and losing at different rates. Um, change is happening uh, very quickly. And so we need leaders who can bounce back quickly and be resilient. And as technology became just, you know, handheld, desktop, laptop, all these different technologies came in. We um, coined this phrase, we mean the broader we, digital leadership. Um, you needed to be effective digital leader. Of course, nobody has a real definition for that, but that's the expectation that we see it showing up on competency models. So here we are in a global pandemic. And now um, a high percentage of leaders and their teams are working remotely. So where remote leadership was more um, uh, incidental across the leadership population, it has become much more central. Um, the idea that both leaders need to balance home and family with work, leaders need to help navigate that within their teams. So here we are in this space and of course, I'm sure many of you are thinking that there are things not on this list. That is true. This is there are there are more things that, depending upon the industry you're in, the role that you're in, the the country that you're in, the specific context that you're in, there is even more on the list, right? So this is where we are in that leadership space. Um, and so as you map. The, expect, the growing expectations for leaders. And I think we would be naive to think we're capping the list where we are now, right? As, as the world becomes more complex, as the workplace becomes more complex, as we understand the dynamics of human beings more, particularly with the um, insights we're getting from neuroscience, we are just gonna continue to have growing expectations uh, around leadership. So what we wanted to share with you a little bit about what was influencing our own from the inside, our own understanding that there was imperative for, uh, for shared leadership. So you know, it's just to give you some um, insights on the, the research space. So first, just understanding what we expect from leaders is a lot, not only as the walkabout we just did, but as we do our research, we have a really clear understanding that um, our expectations of leadership um, are not only high, but they vary based on context. And, and I'll just give you one example. Um, we have done a lot of research around what it means to be an effective leader at different levels organizationally. And what our research shows is that as you go to, through each of these leaps, the expectations grow um, and they get more significant as you go um, higher in the organization. But it's not just that the expectations that lead to um, effectiveness grow, they, uh, they become more complex. So as an individual contributor, um, highly effective leaders place less emphasis on the behavior that we call structuring, being organized, um, being um, laying out procedures and processes. But when you go to become a first line manager, that behavior becomes more important in terms of being effective. But then as you go to become a first line manager to a middle manager, you need to moderate that, tone it down a little bit. And as you go up to a senior manager, you need to not rely on that. So we're expecting this ebb and flow, this sort of sophisticated nuanced way of um, relying more and less on leadership, different leadership behaviors as we move through these levels. And that's just one vantage point, right? You can imagine as we move di to different functions, um, as, we, as we look at leadership in different um, industries, 
it leadership is complex and it's contextual. So what we expect varies based on that. So let's also just take a minute and talk about leaders as individuals, right? With um, diversity and, uh, and inclusion has been in the nomenclature for about three and a half decades now. Uh, of course, recently it has um, become stronger in the spotlight, if you will. Now more commonly, the phrase is diversity, equity, and inclusion, really incorporating the element of equity or fairness in the space. So we are, we are compelled, right, to think of leaders uh, personally, right, to think of who they are. Um, many of you know MRG's research around country differences, and that context of country makes a big difference in the norms of leadership and how leadership is viewed. But even when we look at very specifically the individual leaders, I'll just give you two examples of our research. We look at, as you know, um, if you've been hanging around us for any amount of time, we look at gender patterns and leadership frequently. Um, this is just an example of one study where we look globally um, at leadership and in our leadership assessment, we look at 22 different behaviors. And of those 22, when we look at gender patterns of leadership, 14 of them are different um, based on gender. Some uh, really slight differences and some more moderate differences. So just in the, the um, landscape of gender patterns, and in this case, defining gender in traditional ways, um, in that binary way, we see differences. What about generational patterns? Um, we've done a lot of research in the space and looking at generational patterns relative to age patterns. And if you're interested in that, we're happy to share um, the series of work that we've done in this area. But looking at generational differences just in the US, not even taking into account globally, nine, almost half of the, the behaviors are, are different based on generation. So we know that um, we expect a lot from leaders, that those expectations change as they move in different roles and in different levels. And we are dealing with a very diverse set of leaders. Um, when we think of all the things that go into who the individual is, right? So how can we expect le single leaders to have all of this insight, right? All of this capability. So I'm going to tell you what for us um, really tip the scales if they needed to be tipped in this shared way. Um, and so we, um, we have... An, uh, have participated in a number of conferences that the Neural Leadership Institute has put on. Um, we've developed some nice relationships over the years. And in 2013, um, they reached out to us and asked if we would support um, Matt Lieberman, who is a social cognitive neuroscientist at UCLA, um, in some research that he wanted for a book that he was writing called Social to um, to encapsulate his research. And his research is very much around what we know about the brain um, as it relates to how the brain understands self in relationship to other. And so um, what he was asking for was research looking at leaders who were very relationship focused, but not results focused, leaders who were results focused, but not relationship focused, and then, of course, you know, the holy grail that probably we've been looking at, all looking at, um, as long as we've been studying management and leadership, right, is the leaders who are both high on being relationship focused and being results focused. And so this is an Anglo study. Um, it, it is uh, almost 18,000 leaders from the U.S., Canada, Australia, and the U.K. who have uh, completed MRG's LEA 360 assessment between 2014 and 2019. This is an, uh, an, um, an, up, uh, an upgraded version of the original research that we did. So the first thing that we looked at when we looked at that combined is what percentage of those almost 18,000 leaders were in the top third ranking for both being very relationship focused and results focused. So just to take a minute in your head and, um, and guess a percentage, you know, what percentage were rated as essentially high on both, right? Very results focused and very relationship focused. 
If you guessed less than half percent, you are right on. Um, less than half of those eight, almost 18,000 liters, less than half of a percent, sorry, less than half of a percent of those 18,000 liters were high on both. So um, you can imagine we were startled by that result. And so what we did was we said, okay, top third, you know, high on both is probably practically not necessary. So what about looking at um, just being in the top half um, of both relationships and results? You know, that seemed more practically relevant. Um, you were above the midline for both of these. So take a guess in your mind on this. And if you guessed just um, above 3%, then you, you win the prize. Um, so this was um, startling. You know, the initial uh, research that we did, the numbers were um, actually even a little bit more favorable than this. We keep redoing this so that we can see if the population changes at all. It doesn't. Um, we were a little chagrined, actually, um, and, and a little hesitant in bringing this research back to, to Matt Lieberman. Um, but he ended up being thrilled uh, with the results. And we'll share the link um, that uh, make perfect sense. Well, we learned in talking to him that um, the brain has two separate neural networks. Um, one neural network really focuses on what he calls social thinking, self-awareness, like who am I in relationship to the, to the people around me? It focuses on collaboration and communication. Um, it does the, the kind of meta analysis on am I being authentic? Um, is this other person being authentic? Is this person trustworthy? It's that whole relational piece of our brains. And then there's a separate neural uh, network that focuses on um, that analytic thinking, that um, the, the non-social thinking and acquiring broad knowledge. And it's also where the more results-oriented non-people thinking goes. And what he shared with us is those two neural networks operate in what he calls a neural seesaw. When one is active, the other becomes dormant. And we, we all switch back and forth between these two neural networks. But in fact, we, almost all of us, have a preference to default to one of these neural networks over the other. Um, and of course, you've probably heard uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. The more we use a neural network, the thicker it becomes, the faster it operates, the more our brain tends to default to that neural network. So we are reinforcing, if we're relationship folk, more relationship focused in our leadership, we're reinforcing that social thinking neural network. If we're more results oriented, we're reinforcing that non-social thinking neural network, right? So if we look at just the biology, uh, the neurobiology, it suggests it's hard to be equal in both of these, right? So here we are, you know, we have that brain thing going on. We have all these high expectations uh, uh, of leadership. We have all the diversity uh, uh, of leadership and people coming into leadership. So it's no surprise, I think, that um, we need to, it's time to shift, right? It's time to shift our thinking and how we understand how leadership across an organizational entity actually gets accomplished. So let's take a minute and, um, and do a, a quick poll and um, level set to find out where everybody is. Um, think about just sort of do this quick meta analysis, right? Of the leaders that either you work with internally or if you're a, a coach or consultant of the leaders you work with in client organizations, roughly how many of them um, still expect that individual leaders actually can have a level of mastery or at least a level of competency across this very broad um, range of leadership expectations. Do you think that still most people are walking around going, yes, yeah, sure, leadership is a hard gig, but the really good ones can do it all. Are you starting to see a shift and maybe about half of them are still thinking this? Um, maybe only a few, maybe you're in a rare situation where um, 
the leaders that you work with have already moved into this idea of a shared approach to leadership. Thanks, Tricia. Thanks for logging in with those votes, everyone. Um, I'll give you just another moment or two and uh, also encourage folks to uh, go ahead and put questions. Also, um, we'll be stopping for a Q&A break in just a moment or two. So um, if you have any questions at all that have come up, now's a great time to put those in. Um, and we'll just finish calculating the votes and share these results. We won't make you wait days for these. How about? <laughs> oh, cool. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we have 57% um, uh, say most of them, 23% say about half, 18% say a few, and just 2% uh, say almost none. Two, two are in Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, uh, this is our position at MRG. The leadership demands have become too complex for any single individual to master. Um, it, you know, it is now, I think, the time where we need to think about leadership as something that needs to happen across the full organizational landscape and that the leader, him or herself, needs to be thinking about how do I contribute to this and then how do I build mechanisms for uh, shared leadership. And so we are, I guess I would say we're on a mission, right, This that to really squash this myth that the heroic leader who can do it all actually is the norm to aspire to. So why don't we just take a minute and see if we have questions to share. Uh, thanks, Tricia. So one question that came up, um, can you speak to how this relates to competency models and how you deal with encountering a competency model that's asking for a heroic leader? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, there was, you know, there was a moment in time a few years ago where competency models were kind of um, starting to lose um, ground in favor of uh, a more succinct statement of values, um, but uh, that sort of stalled out, and so we're still seeing a lot of competency models, and if, if you're like us, <laughs> you have seen um, competency models where you could add um, leaps tall buildings in a single bound as the, as the 13th competency and it would seem like it fit well with, with the matrix because we are asking, um, we're asking too much of leaders. But if we think about, if we can just shift the mindset, not in terms of necessarily shrinking the competency model, but instead understand that we're building a competency model for an organization not, or even for a team, but not for an individual leader. And so we can be talking about how do we build shared leadership to actually have all these competencies across the system or across the team or across the group, but not within the body of one leader. That would be, the, that would be awesome. <laughs> uh, to keep us uh, on time. I'm going to go ahead and um, let us move on, but do keep putting those questions in. We have another um, Q&A break, so please continue to add those in and uh, we'll make sure to come back to them either during the broadcast or afterwards. So please keep them coming. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lucy. Um, and thanks, Trisha, for that uh, wonderful setup. Uh, you know, what's just most interesting to me, you know, I think uh, I think the group got it right in terms of that poll. Um, and when you take that poll uh, in relation to the research that Trisha shared right before it, um, it, it presents sort of a, an interesting picture, right? You know, it, it really presents a, a picture of a lot of leaders out there trying to do it all um, and really at no fault of their own, uh, they're probably coming up short in some way or another. Um, and it's just because what is being asked of them is just too much and the expectations are just too great. Um, and the variety at which they are being asked to uh, pursue excellence uh, is, is again too much. So um, I'm here today to really present a quick case study to you um, about some work that I did recently uh, where it was just some, some team development work uh, for an organization that I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, and this work really centered around team dynamics uh, and how we could implement the idea of a shared approach to leadership. This was a group of people who um, really was not a group of misfits, but a, a group that was relatively high performing, but they were really hoping to uh, get better together. Uh, and so we uh, implemented a, a few different uh, aspects of, of shared leadership, uh, along with some assessments to, uh, to head down this path. And that's what I'm going to share with you here today. 
Um, the uh, Just so you're aware, I'm going to be talking about the LEA 360 today. Trisha has already made mention of it. I know that many of you on the call today are um, are LEA, LEA certified, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who are not, just very briefly, um, the LEA is our assessment that speaks about leadership behavior and would really measure frequency of behavior. So uh, it really talks about um, what a what leadership behaviors would leaders be emphasizing uh, versus not? Which leaders what uh, behaviors would they be prioritizing versus not? And when you have the 360 version or the multi rater version of this, you get a nice picture of how a leader feels like they are showing up, um, and then also how they are being experienced by um, their observers. Right. So a, a really full picture of how their leadership behavior is being presented. Uh, it also is accompanied by uh, the uh, an, another assessment called uh, the Leadership Impact Report or the Leadership Imp or Part B of the LEA. Uh, and this is uh, our really, our, I will call it the more evaluative side uh, of this assessment um, and talks about the uh, leadership competencies um, and whether or not uh, you know, leaders have a, a skill or ability within a particular competency. So, while the LEA itself in those 20 ship, 22 leadership behaviors is just about frequency of behavior, uh, the competency side of it is much more evaluative in terms of skill, of skill or ability, but is also critical toward our ability to run a lot of the research that we do, including the research that um, Trisha shared uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, so again, this will be the, the these are the 22 LEA behaviors um, and you just the reason for this slide is just letting you know that these sit within um, six different leadership functions um, and these behaviors sitting within each of these functions all uh, really share a common theme or a common objective, um, whether that be really the thinking space of leadership inside of creating a vision or really the uh, we'll call it the execution side of things or pushing for results in terms of achieving results. Um, these are how uh, the behaviors are, are set up and really is uh, represents the, the leadership model as, as we see it. So let's set this case study up. Um, so the organization that I did this work with um, was a nonprofit healthcare organization. Um, and not a new organization, been around for, for some time. Um, and historically, the, the mission and the goal of this organization was focused on serving the community. Um, and focused on serving the community in much more of a reactive way, right? So people get sick, they come to our locations and we tend to them, right? Um, and, and that is the way that this organization has functioned for, 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 for its entire uh, existence. Um, over the past couple of years, uh, the organization um, has had a, 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 I'll call it a change in management, new CEO, uh, and then also a change in, uh, I'll say, vi a vision or mission or goal to move from a reactive to a proactive model of healthcare. Uh, and what they really meant was that, um, can we uh, integrate ourselves into the community um, to actually prevent sickness versus just trying to treat it? Right, so it really was a relatively a large change in mindset of, of going from that reactive to the proactive uh, idea of healthcare, and how can we just keep people healthier across the board uh, versus just dealing with them when they get uh, sick or ill. Uh, and so the team that I'm working with worked with was the executive team, so the senior senior team of six. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, this was a, a senior team of six that worked together uh, for some time, uh, were relatively close knit, were already highly performing, right? As I said, this is not a group of, of misfits. I'm not, we weren't here to, to, to solve, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, gaping issues within this team or this organization. But again, they really recognize that this change in mission and change in goal and, and change in really their value proposition was going to be a challenge. Um, I would also say, though, that this team was exhibiting some classic, I'm going to call them nonprofit issues. Um, first being clarity, clarity among the six of them, but then also clarity to the organization. And I would say that this was heightened, uh, again, in terms of this change in mindset or change in shift from the reactive to the proactive. Um, why are we doing what we're doing? What is expected of me? How are decisions being made? Um, there was a lot of ambiguity there, uh, not only within the team of six, but then also I think that was disseminated out into the organization as well. Also some issues within decision-making. And I would say more specifically when there was disagreement. 
Um, so I would say disagreement amongst the team of six uh, was not handled very well. It was more, there, there was disagreement in the air and everyone would get a little quiet and then we'd leave the room and then somehow down the road, the decision would get made. So uh, the, sort of the decision-making process was a little bit, cha I don't wanna say chaotic, but a little bit circuitous um, and maybe too deliberate at times. And we also had a little bit of an accountability problem, um, not much so uh, with the team of six, but more so with them holding their, uh, their teams uh, and the team teams uh, accountable for the, for the work that was being done. Um, and then finally, a little bit of an interesting team dynamic, which I'll just mention here and I'll, I'll reference here again in a second, in terms of the team showing up and really um, putting uh, into play or, or, or showing that you know, everything is going well. My house is in order. Um, you know, things are. We're making decisions. We're getting work done. We're moving forward. You know, things are good. Um, uh, the truth probably was a, a, a little bit somewhere in between. Uh, so you know, they're in the room with the six of them. Things seem very clean. They leave the room. Things probably a little bit more messy than they might have been letting on. So. What was the, uh, the goal of the work that, uh, that, that they brought us in for? The first was to use strategic directions, which I'll talk about in two seconds, and the enhanced LEA 360 composite report to really ferret out and then also address uh, potentially some of the concerns that were going on with this team of six and then also potentially the broader organization. Um, again, we, they used, we used the LE360. Um, before they did that though, we utilized the uh, strategic directions, which Again, if you're certified in LEA, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who are not, Strategic Directions is an offshoot of the LEA that allows organizations to um, identify and isolate the particular behaviors within the LEA that they really want to focus on, that they deem as important in terms of their, uh, their short-term objectives and short-term goals you know, over the next two or three years. So the strategic direction process allows them to isolate, you know, six to eight behaviors potentially that they really want to focus on, that they really think are critical um, uh, to ensure their success in the short term. And then the LEA360, again, this group of, uh, of six took the LEA360 and we used their aggregate data um, with, the, uh, with the enhanced LEA360 composite report to, again, identify what some of the, uh, the issues were uh, and how we could potentially go about um, uh, addressing the concerns. And then again, the broader goal here of um, promoting the idea of being better together and how could we utilize the idea of shared leadership um, in doing so. So um, I just wanna share a couple pages uh, from the LEA Enhanced Composite that were really critical toward this work. Um, again, because they had a strategic directions, one of, the set, one of the sections of this report is a strategic directions gap analysis. My point in showing you this page is, not only I wanna share with you what the strategic direction profile was, but also to give you a, a little bit of an idea of what some of the data was for this group. So these were the eight behaviors that the, this group uh, landed on from innovative all the way through uh, consensual. Um, just very briefly, I would say innovative, strategic and persuasive is really again, that thinking space of leadership and how do we convince people that this is the way to go. You've then got structure and communication, feedback and management focus, which is really the, um, I'm gonna call it the execution side of leadership and really the, uh, I'm gonna say taking initiative and in the, in the accountability side of leadership. And then consensual at the bottom, I would say this was chosen because it was such a core tenant of this organization in terms of how decisions were being made, ensuring that people were being brought into the decision-making process, people were feeling heard, um, ideas were being heard, um, and people really felt like uh, what they were bringing to the table was being valued. So this page was interesting to the group. I would say um, this one was even more interesting in terms of identifying what was going on um, and what is it potentially that they wanted to focus on. Uh, so this was, uh, again, an offshoot of the strategic direction profile, the, the, da the data that we just looked at, but isolating the behaviors that were potentially underutilized from this group. Again, we use the 360 version of the LEA. So you're seeing um, not only the self data, but the, the data from the boss, the peers and the direct reports. And what really struck the group here is um, those purple dots. So the direct report responses to five of the eight behaviors um, on the strategic direction profile. So you'll see that the potentially there's uh, you know, some behaviors were being underutilized within this profile from the direct report point of view, persuasive, structuring, communication, feedback, and management focus. Um, and you know, I think what really, really hit this group uh, of six 
were those four, uh, the last four that I just mentioned, the structuring through management focus. Um, and they really wanted to dive a little bit deeper to understand what was going on and how potentially could they um, address, uh, address these concerns. I think what sort of was the nail in the coffin for them in terms of uh, identifying what it is that they wanted to focus and work on was the uh, developmental opportunity section of the enhanced composite which is derived from MRG research. So what we've done in this section is we have created a, a few competencies. One of them uh, shown here is performance and results. Um, we've done some research to identify which behaviors are most predictive in terms of success within that particular competency. And then we uh, compare the data for the particular group to get some understanding about where uh, things are going well uh, and potentially there are some developmental opportunities. And what you'll see here again is boy, there are a lot of up arrows uh, or explore increased behavior for the direct report right side of things. So it was really reinforcing what was going on with the, the previous page uh, or the uh, behaviors potentially underutilized with the strategic direction profile. And then interestingly, just because I thought it was interesting and we did talk about it a lot, look at the peer group. Green check mark, green check mark, green check mark. So it was really, this really hammered the story uh, of, uh, we show up as a group of six and it's not that we're pretending, but we really show up and put on this image that things are going great, right? Um, uh, that we really have everything under control, that we're making decisions and performances is occurring at, at a good pace. And then you leave the room. And again, that direct report side of things is, ah, it's a little bit messier than, than I think potentially we're letting on. So after we you know, went through these a couple of sections, they really wanted to, to start talking about um, the execution side of things and the execution side of things with themselves and also with the direct reports. I know this is a really busy slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but what, what I want to uh, just show here um, is uh, how we started moving toward this idea of shared leadership, right? So we had uh, this, and this is just uh, three of the profiles within this group. We've got the CEO, the director of innovation and strategy and the director of services. Um, and these are their individual profiles. The CEO had his responsibilities um, that like a normal CEO would have. Director of innovation and strategy uh, was really, I'm gonna say the, uh, the, the right hand woman uh, for the CEO uh, in terms of being a thinking partner and ensuring that the organization was thinking about things in the correct way and, uh, and really keeping a strategic mindset in terms of why they were doing things. And then you had the director of services, which really, um, I'm going to say, uh, an ops role and was uh, really critical toward the historical aspect of the organization, ensuring that the services side of the organization was was functioning, right? Uh, so this individual would oversee all of the the um, the locations where that where services would be delivered, overseeing the nurses and the technicians and all of that. So this is really is the person who is uh, uh, maintaining the operational side of the organization. And you'll see here that I've highlighted four behaviors, which I'm going to talk about here in a second, um, but structuring communication, feedback, and management focus. All four of these are within the strategic direction profile, and we're going to hone in on the direct report observations from these four behaviors, right? So um, this, is a, this is the same data you saw on the previous slide, just a little bit easier to take a look at. So again, we've got the CEO, Director of Innovation Strategy, Director of Services, and this, these are their scores across these four behaviors for structuring, communication, feedback, and management focus. What I wanna say here is a couple of things. First of all, these behaviors are really critical um, toward the execution side of leadership, right? Structuring is about being planful um, and being detail oriented really before things even get started, right? People who score high in this, in this behavior are people who would, are leaders who would say, I like to have a plan in terms of how things are gonna get done. Leaders who score lower on this dimension are people who will say, let's just get started and we'll figure it out as, as we go along. Communication, not only is this idea of being a conduit of information, but it also is about being very articulate in terms of your expectations, right? Letting people know what is expected of them. Feedback is about delivering feedback in a candid uh, and straightforward manner. Whether it be good, bad, or otherwise, feedback is just about letting people know how they're doing against expectations. And then finally, management focus, really important behavior in terms of leadership. And it really is, I'm going to call it the sort of, when you think of classic leadership behaviors, they're really encompassed within management focus about, you know, taking an initiative, um, uh, being willing to sort of push the accountability button uh, uh, and, uh, and being okay being out in front and enjoying, I'm going to say, facilitating the work of other people. So um, what do we see here? 
I would, the first thing that I want to pull out here is as a whole, this group as a whole has relatively low scores on all four of these behaviors. The majority of the scores are sitting at 40, 45 or below. Right. Um, and so, uh, and so that's a, that's just a, uh, you know, a, something to keep in the, in the back of your mind as we go through this. Um, the second thing is here is just take a look at that blue line, the CEO, right? He's a great guy. Um, but you know uh, he's sitting uh, very low across all four of uh, of these exe uh, of these execution side behaviors. And when you think back on terms of the the uh, the research that Trisha presented, um, in terms of that task oriented or that performance side of things, that neural seesaw, you know where is he sitting? He's sitting much more on that relationship side of things, and that is his priority, right? Um, so I, that's just something else I want I want to pull out. There's also, you know, I, there's some clumping of scores here, but also some important disparities. And this is where we really get into the shared leadership side of things, right? So the director of services, that gray line, um, you know, she's got the highest score in structure and highest score in communication, highest score in feedback, um, but then the lowest score in management focus, right? And then the director of innovation and strategy, so she is sort of sitting in the middle, but with a, a higher score in communication, and then importantly, very high score in management focus. What's interesting about this though, right, is that the, the person who is in charge of operations, the person who is in charge of getting things done, the person who really needs to be um, you know, out there, out in front, has the lowest management focus score. Um, she's doing the work, right? She's higher in structuring, she's higher in communication, she's higher in feedback, at least in relation to uh, the other folks on the team or at least uh, the other fo two folks here. Um, but in terms of you know, being really comfortable out in front, She's got a really low management focus score there. So um, this is, again, where we really get into the shared leadership space. Um, and so the, uh, you know, the, first of all, this, just the execution and the results side of things really is a concerning area. I think the, the feedback here really uh, cemented this for this group. Um, and I would say a couple of things here. First of all, the group wasn't surprised that the director of services had some of the higher scores on the execution side of things. But it was interesting in terms of, okay, what can we learn from you uh, in terms of these behaviors that we might, be, we might need to be implementing more? And then also really importantly, how can we support you? I think what they really recognized here was how much of this work was rolling up to her um, and they were relying upon her and not even potentially knowing it to do, you know, to, to be a little bit more planful, to really communicate what the expectations, to really deliver the feedback. Um, and so they really came to this place of how we can support you. And then finally is this twist on management focus, right? And there was something, I'm going to share an anecdote here in a second that I think really crystallized this for this group um, and really crystallized how shared leadership is important for them moving forward. Um, but again, the ops or the director of services, lower score here um, and her really her role was getting it done. Um, but being out in front was, I, I'm gonna say a little bit taxing for her. She clearly was one of the, uh, I'll just call it meekest people in the group, right? Um, uh, but she was also working very hard on, on many of these behaviors to ensure that things were getting done. And then you've got the director of innovation and strategy who really isn't you know, responsible for getting things done. Um, uh, is more of a thinking partner of the CEO and she's got the highest management focus score of the group by a long shot, right? Um, and I, the story that I wanna share that really crystallized this for this group is let's go back six months um, to, to April, oh, March and April. Um, and I know for some of us, it probably feels like yesterday. For others, it probably feels like 19 years ago, but COVID is upon us, right? And, uh, and it creates uh, just an immense amount of confusion, ambiguity, and what the heck is going on. Um, and organizations are having to move quickly, right? Okay, how do we handle this? How do we do? What, you know, what, what decisions do we need to make? What do we need to put into place? And the CEO, in this organization, love him, but um, not a sweet spot for him. And he was relying upon his normal way of making decisions uh, in terms of being very consensual, very deliberate, ensuring that everyone was aligned um, and not really wanting to ruffle any feathers. Um, and, uh, and they were a couple weeks into this when the director of innovation and strategy pulled him aside and said, hey, this has got to stop. You got to make some decisions here. You got to make some calls. You got to make them quick. You got to be okay with ruffling feathers because if we don't do it, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. 
it was an eye-opening experience for him. As I'm talking about shared leadership, he's the one who shared this story uh, to, for, to me and the group. Um, and it really crystallized for the group how important it is for them to work together uh, and how it is how they can um, uh, utilize each other's strengths to ensure that they are doing their best work, not only for themselves, but for the organization. Um, and uh, that story, I think, really helped them understand, uh, you know, what it is that they needed to focus on together as a group, how they could uh, rely upon each other uh, a little bit more fundamentally in terms of how things are getting done, and where also um, some of their, their strengths uh, and potentially areas for opportunity were, and how they could come together to, to work together. So I think this is a great sort of case study in terms of really understanding uh, and, and pushing for moving toward a model of shared leadership. I mean, between the research that Tricia has shared, the poll that you, you all put in there, and then this is a, a little case study here and some data that shared leadership really is a, uh, an effective way of potentially working uh, together. Um, I just because you know you'll have access to the deck here after the the webinar. I just wanted to throw in uh, some coaching prompts to help identify what uh, some shared leadership opportunities might be. I used several of these um, in the work that I did uh, and uh, with this group, and I think that this is a great starting point um, for anyone who's thinking about potentially um, uh, you know venturing down this shared leadership path. Uh, and uh, and this is a great starting place. So uh, these are these are here for for your reference. Okay, uh, any questions while I transfer it back to Tricia for a wrap up here? Um, a few great ones are coming in and keep them coming folks because we will follow up um, if we don't have a chance to answer them right away. But Drew, one quick question for you. How many um, people can you put in that um, report, in that, in that composite report? That is a good question. I don't know that there is uh, a limit off the top of my head, but I will, we there will confirm. There isn't a limit. Yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. yeah. Thanks, Georgia. Um, uh, so yeah, no no limit at all. Um, I oh, some really great ones are coming in, but I do want to make sure Trisha can wrap up. So if we have time, we'll do um, a couple more at the end, and then we will have um, all of these answers will come to you via email as well. When we do the Q and A, we'll have a follow up blog post that'll have all of these, and everyone please read it because there's some great questions coming in. So um, I will move us forward, but uh, do keep do keep asking. Great, thanks. Thanks to both of you. Um, so let's talk a little bit, you know, those coaching questions are great, but there we also have some tips that you can use more systemically. So um, let's move to that. But before we do, let's check in. Um, now that you're sort of thinking about more this idea of shared leadership, how many of the leaders that you work with are actually practicing some form of, and I'm gonna emphasize this, intentional shared leadership? Right, they're, they're, uh, they're working closely with others. They're using the uh, examples like um, uh, Drew illustrated in, the, illustrated in the case study. They're inviting people in. I know you have the skill that I don't have. They're reaching out to others and saying, I can see you're struggling with this and happy to help. Um, how, how many of the leaders that you're working with are practicing some form of intentional shared leadership, whether it's just an advice exchange or they're actually working more collaboratively together to take care of the, the broader range of leadership expectations and needs. Coming, it's coming, it's coming. I was like <laughs> drum roll. Oh, good. So this is nice. Yeah, right? about, uh, yeah, let's see, 10% said most of them, 28% uh, said about half. 52% said a few of them and 10% almost none. It's interesting, right? You kind of wonder how many are doing it at, um, out of desperation, but I guess desperation um, sometimes leads us to the right path. So I'm going to just briefly share with you, um, uh, Drew shared the coaching prompts, which are really helpful to get people thinking about shared leadership in an individual context or in a team context. Um, but there are six ways that more systemically you can think about um, shared leadership. So one is the most formal way, right? With projects or even tasks to formalize the idea that we start from the beginning, we're gonna do this together. Um, and we spend time thinking about 
This is the skill set I have. This is the skill set you have. We actually do this in our organization um, of really looking at, and it's not just oftentimes two people. We sometimes have three or four people who are all um, taking a leadership role uh, in particular projects. Um, so really, but formalizing it so that people know we're doing this together and here's my role and skill set and here's your role and skill set. This is how we'll navigate this. This is absolutely my favorite go-to for a shared leadership strategy because everybody can use it. I always say to people when I'm coaching, so if, and I'm looking at their data and I'm saying, well, you're not as strategic, but you're really good at communication, or you're not as persuasive, but you're very innovative. It's like, who around you that you respect does this behavior or, or this part of leadership really well? And can you invite them into a thinking partnership? Can you take the problems, the opportunities, the decisions that you need to make and use them as a thinking partner? And what it does is not only is it great for the brain because it opens up the mind to different possibilities, but it takes the burden away from the individual of, I need to be strategic, but it's really hard for me, or I need to be more persuasive, but I don't have yet that full skill set built. So this idea of thinking partnerships is a great model. Um, particularly, it's, a, it's also a great model to um, help people enter into the idea of shared leadership. We also talk to, to leaders who are running teams as running them like microorganizations. You know, nobody bats an eye when the CEO has a head of marketing and a head of finance and a head of sales and a head of technology and a head of manufacturing. It's like, of course, everybody has their defined roles and there is an expectation that they're going to carry with it a particular leadership lens. I ask um, leaders who are running teams like, Again, what are you good at? What behaviors do you have? Where do you go naturally? What's missing in terms of what your department or your team needs? And who on your team has that skill set, has that mindset? And how do you build that sort of system together so that, again, as Drew's example showed, that we, we've got it all covered if we look at all of us. So how do we create the space so that we can together span more of the leadership need, span more of the competency model, right? Um, I like to encourage people to look for peer mentors and or peer coaches. Um, I find that people uh, relax a little bit more when they're working with people at equivalent levels to them. So a peer mentor is somebody you're specifically trying to learn something from. You know, this person really drives results um, higher and higher in a constructive way through their de department more than I do to mine. And I want to learn how they do that. So I'm going to ask that person to be my mentor in stretching for results. Um, peer coaching is more um, sort of egalitarian. We're coming together to help each other. And you know, as most, if not all of you know, what coaching really is, is asking open-ended questions, listening with a level of insight and reflecting back to the individual. So if we can do that with each other as peers and then sprinkle in some peer insights and maybe even advice, Again, I'm not alone in the space and I'm expanding my leadership repertoire. I'm expanding my leadership perspective and also the kind of the added benefit of not feeling alone. Peer advisory groups are more formal um, where you almost use them as a board, right? So it's more formal and you'd use it a little bit less frequently, but it's a group that you would go to where the actual role is to listen to the situation and to provide advice, right? It's, a, a, it, it is the intention is I'm gonna share with you what I would do in your situation. Um, and so the individual who is asking the advisory board has the opportunity to hear a bunch of ideas and take them away to think about them, right? A peer advisory group usually ask, you know, for those of you who know things like mastermind groups or Vis Vistage or women's president organization or young's president organization, that's what those are is I listen and I give you advice from my own experience. And then finally, really helping to facilitate a less hierarchical mindset of leadership. Um, and I will tell you the number one way to begin to change the mindset about this is to coach leaders to ask for feedback 
from people more junior than them in the organization, including their team, and to be very good at asking and taking in the feedback. That seems to be the number one way of people saying, oh, yes, she has the title, but she doesn't live in the hierarchy, right? That, that we are modeling the idea that leadership learning happens up, down, and sideways, right? So really working with that um, less attentiveness to the title, right? And if we're talking about shared leadership, I can share it with people above me who are my peers, or I can share it um, with people who are more junior than I am. So, you know, we're in this crazy time, right? This pandemic now, and we would just say, you know, now even more than ever, people are feeling more vulnerable. So the idea that I'm not in this alone, when we are in these vulnerable uncertain times, we default to habitual patterns of thinking and acting. So we tend to on our own, we narrow our approach to leadership. So again, that shared space helps me not go in those well-trodden routes Connection and support are even more important when, when folks are feeling so isolated. So shared leadership gives me a platform for connection and support. And of course, it's really hard to take perspective on our own when we're in these times of uncertainty. So this shared leadership gives us the opportunity for better perspective taking. So here we are, you know, it's getting harder and we're in a more uncertain time. The demands of leadership are not going to stop growing. Um, and we're going to, as, an, as a world, hopefully continue to commit to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we just think that the case is really strong to shift to this paradigm of shared leadership. Thanks, Tricia. Uh, thanks everyone for staying with us um, as we get to the end of the hour. You will get all of these materials, the slides, the recording, um, some great Q&A will come out of this. Continue to throw those in the box uh, if you have a minute before you go. Um, you'll get all of that via email very soon. Um, and uh, please, if you are registered in the LEA, we're actually doing a very interactive workshop um, coming up about this enhanced composite report. And a lot of these great questions that came in were a little bit practical about what do I, what are we really doing when we get into it? Um, and this is going to be a great opportunity for that. It is free. You do need to be LEA certified and space is limited. So just uh, hop over to mrg.com now and go to the calendar um, and you'll find that, that workshop there um, as well as some other events coming up. If you're not certified in the LEA, um, our next certification starts on November 24th, and that's actually in U.S. evening time. Um, and so uh, that, that works for some folks, um, and we'll have more LEA certifications coming in the new year as well. Um, so I will let everyone go. Thanks again so much for joining us. Uh, send any questions you continue to have our way, and keep an eye out on your inbox for um, all these great materials. Thanks again. Uh, stay well, and we'll see you next time.